Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on APA style, looking at the major sections of a manuscript. And of course, APA style is comprehensively covered in the publication manual of the American Psychological Association. So we're going to start uh, looking at some of the concepts of APA style on page three of a manuscript here, uh, which of course is the introduction or literature review. I typically refer to it as the literature review. So I want to point out some key aspects uh, of this section. The opening sentence of literature review is usually broad and well cited. And you can see from this example here, uh, a sweeping broad statement to open up and a lot of supporting citations. Also, you want to discuss the importance of the problem. So you can see there's key phrases here. Uh, there are a few studies. There is limited research. You want to make sure that you get your discussion, part of your discussion about the importance of the problem in, in your first paragraph, uh, and mostly have the importance of the problem just fully discussed uh, within the first two or three paragraphs. You also want to relate the current study to prior research. You can see from what I've highlighted here, uh, a lot of prior research uh, cited that relates to this particular uh, study. So as we move down, still in the literature review here, a key component of effective writing is the synthesis of multiple sources to support the statements that you make in your manuscript. Of course, this is important throughout the entire manuscript, but it's most prominent in the early portion of the literature review. So you can see in this uh, one paragraph, I have woven in a number of citations uh, some of the multiple citations. And this is considered uh, appropriate, like I said, particularly for uh, early on in the literature review. As you move further on the literature review, there'll be less synthesis. Uh, but it's rarely a good idea, for example, to have one especially large paragraph supported by just one um, citation try to find other citations that can also support elements of the paragraph. So try to keep the synthesis going, uh, maybe not at an intense level as you see here, but try to keep the synthesis going throughout the literature review. So as we move down here to page five, I want to speak for a moment about the proper structure, organization, and placement of paragraphs. These are absolutely crucial to effective written communication, including uh, APA style. So in this example, in this paragraph here, notice how every supporting sentence is directly tied to the opening sentence. This is an important part of writing that is often overlooked. Oftentimes I'll see paragraphs that have a good opening sentence and then the paragraph runs off kind of another direction. So all these sentences should support, enhance, expand upon that topic sentence and not discuss other areas. So there are a few ways that you can do this. You can outline uh, the key points you want to make and then underneath of that build and, and find uh, will find works and then build supporting sentences that match and kind of build your paragraphs out that way or you can find as you go through the process and you're writing paragraphs that you've written a good paragraph and, and the supporting sentences all go in one direction they just don't match your topic sentence so you can make some modifications to your topic sentence so it's more congruent 
with the supporting sentences. I prefer the former method where I align all the supporting sentences after I've already written um, the topic sentence because that helps keep the hierarchy uh, a little easier to organize. Uh, whereas with the latter method, it becomes a little more difficult to maintain control of the hierarchy. All right, so moving down to page 6, let's take a look at subheadings. So subheadings are used to logically divide the content. So this relates to what I was just saying earlier about the hierarchy. You only want to create a new level heading when there will be at least two headings at that new level. Otherwise, try to fit the content under the current heading level. So what that means, for example, and you can see there's two uh, second level headings here, co-occurring disorders and other factors. And up further, uh, you have uh, borderline, post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's several level two headings here. But if you're working on a paper like this and you developed a second level heading of just co-occurring disorders and had no other second level headings, you would want to find a way to integrate that into the level one heading. Now, it's important to note here that it's very common to have uh, level one headings, and it's actually uh, mandatory, and it's very common to have level two headings, particularly in the uh, literature review and the method uh, sections. But you can also see uh, level two headings in the uh, results section, potentially, and certainly in the discussion section. The need for more caution when creating headings really uh, comes about when you're looking at a level three heading. Now remember in APA style, you can have up to five levels. Uh, that's very unusual to, to need all five levels. Uh, typically, you use level one and two, and maybe in some situations, a level three heading very rarely we ever use a level four or level five heading. If you find yourself using all five levels, you may want to consider uh, restructuring the paper a little bit. Uh, that's not always indicative of a paper that has been uh, well organized. So moving down to page seven. So now we're reaching the end of the literature review. And you want to have a few things, uh, at, at a minimum, that are contained in the final paragraph or paragraphs of your literature review. Uh, one thing you want to have is your research question. Now you can see here uh, it's formatted as a statement, but that's okay. It still captures the essence of the research question. And of course you want to have uh, a hypothesis stated, uh, or, or hypotheses. In this case, uh, you can see uh, there is a hypo hypothesis which is stated right at the end of the literature review. I feel it's important as well to make sure that the research questions or these statements which indicate essentially the same thing uh, appear before, are written before uh, the hypotheses. Now let's take a look at the method section. So we can see here you have method. This is a level one heading and of course participants a level two heading. Before I discuss the different elements that I typically use, the different level two headings I typically use uh, in my manuscripts, I want to note that there's a lot of different ways to break up the method section. Um, it is generally agreed upon, however, that it does need to be broken up with level two headings. However, those level two headings will change depending on what you're describing, what your method was like. So I'll be reviewing four level two headings that I often use, but of course there are differences between manuscripts. So here we start with the participants section, and here you want to include a description of the participants, including demographics, the sample size, uh, the region uh, of the country, and of course 
you know, if the country is another country outside the United States, you want to indicate that. Inclusion and exclusion criteria, the sampling method, the participation rate, attrition, and you want to note if the participants received any compensation. Remember, you are offering a fairly detailed description of these participants. Make sure not to include any identifying information. We're talking about uh, general participant information, you know, percentages, for example, for demographics, not the names or any other information that could identify uh, your participants. So now we'll move down to the procedure section. So again, in papers that I write, this is typically the format that I will fall. Uh, in the, I'll have the participants, and then the next one, section level two heading, of course, will be the procedure. Now here you want a detailed description of the procedure, including how consent was obtained, a description of the setting, for example, if it was in a community mental health clinic, the instructions that were provided to participants, the researcher and participant activity. And what I mean by that is you want to detail what everybody did. Because remember, the, the point, or one of the major points of the procedure is having the, your method be reproducible. Um, so it needs to be, uh, other researchers need to be able to replicate it. So you need to talk about what the researcher and the participants actually did. Uh, you want the treatment or independent variable, and of course the treatment sequence and timing. And then you want to mention the measure or dependent variable. Of course, the uh, greater amount of information about the uh, measure or measures will be discussed later. And of course, you want any debriefing uh, information as well. It's not unusual in procedure uh, if it's not already uh, covered in participants, or even if it is, there's some overlap, is to talk about the research design. And that's uh, really what you're doing when you're talking about the treatment, the sequence and the timing and the dependent variable and what the researcher and uh, participants did. Uh, but that is, uh, I typically cover research design and procedure. So moving down to the, the next section, I usually call this section measures. Of course, it could be called assessments or instruments uh, or a variety of other uh, names as well. It's a level two heading. It includes a detailed description of the instrument or instruments used in the current study, including the format. Uh, for example, is it a paper and pencil or computer administered? The number of items. In this case, of course, this is a 90 item. The response format, uh, you know, meaning are the participants checking off uh, a box from one to four, like a Likert scale. The scales, and you can see uh, in this particular instrument, there are nine subscales. Sometimes we just call those scales. The scoring procedures, again, that could be hand scored or, or scored uh, by a computer. Um, oftentimes we include a brief history of the instrument, although it's not always required. And oftentimes we include psychometric properties for example, reliability and validity. So now let's move down to the last section that I would typically include uh, in the method. It's a level two heading. Uh, it's analysis. Sometimes it's called statistical analysis. And here you include a description of the statistical analyses used in the study, including descriptive, uh, for example, mean, median, mode, standard deviation, inferential, for example, ANOVA, ANOVA, a t-test, or other analyses like factor analysis, and the software that was used. So it's important to recognize an analysis section is we're not discussing results. We're not discussing what happened in an analysis section. We're simply indicating the actual analyses that were used. So now let's move to the results section. And you can see that results is a level one heading. So it's a completely different section from method. It's not part of the method section. 
in the results section you have the actual results of the statistical analyses. But in this section we do not offer an interpretation of the results. It's acceptable and appropriate to presume that the reader has a good knowledge of statistics. So what that really means is that every detail doesn't have to be explained. You can, you can presume they know the way around statistics fairly well. You want to report the statistic values, for example, an F value or T value, the degrees of freedom, uh, the P value or alpha, the effect size, for example, Cohen's D or partial eta squared, and the confidence intervals. The example I have here does not include the confidence intervals. So you can see the different uh, formatting for the statistics, for the results of, of these statistical tests. Uh, this is a F test, a P value, and this is a partial eta squared. So now moving to the final section I'll be covering in this video, which is the discussion. You can see the discussion is a separate section, it's a level one heading. And here we do want to interpret the results, the results that were just revealed in the section prior. You want to start by indicating whether or not the hypothesis or hypotheses were supported. In your interpretation, factor in internal and external threats to validity, the effect sizes that you observed, and other limitations of your study. Also discuss alternative explanations for the findings. Detail the importance of the findings and how they can be applied to the field. Additionally, offer direction for future research. So you can see in this particular discussion section, uh, implications for the treatment community is level two heading, and limitations is level two heading. So this is, a, I think, a fairly logical way to divide up a discussion section. So in the discussion section, more so than any other section of the paper, is where you as an author really have a voice. Remember, in the literature review, you are talking about your topic, but you're relating it to prior research. The method is simply the method you used. The results, well, they are just what you found using statistics. It's in the discussion section where it all comes together. And your interpretation is what is important and what the reader wants to see. So usually in discussion sections you see fewer citations from outside sources as you as the author are writing most of the content. I hope you found this video helpful and I want you to thank you for watching. As always if you have any questions or concerns Feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to assist you.